Hey everyone, thanks for checking out the channel. My name is Forrest and I'm really excited for you to join me on this analytical adventure today. This is the first video on the channel. I'm really excited to start posting here. One of my New Year's resolutions was to analyze all 389 Bach chorales and I wanted to do one a day because it kind of works out to be at least one a day. I'll kind of bleed into the new year. I'm already starting a little bit late because the beginning of the year was really busy for me, but I'm going to try and upload once a day. Maybe I'll do some double uploads or comp compensate for days where I'm busier. However, here I am. We're looking at Bach Chorale number one. Uh, there are two different editions that I've been finding. The one that I currently have in my library is this one right here, 389 corrals, and it's hard for me to flip with the camera <laughs> in the position that it is now, but it's actually um, alphabetical. You can kind of see here in the table of contents, actually, it might save me that all of them are alphabetically, they're all alphabetically published. They're in the book in alphabetical order, which doesn't do me too much it doesn't do me too many favors in terms of, you know, seeing Bach's growth as a composer because his early work is definitely a lot tamer than his later works where he was more, ex uh, I would say more chromatically expressive and definitely more experimental in terms of his uh, modulations and his uh, choices and keys and his melodies and really just a lot of the aspects of his works. That being said, uh, I chose another edition that wasn't alphabetical, and I wasn't able to find any information about it being in chronological order, but I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Because the first chorale that we're going to be looking at today is relatively tame. It's something that I would, you know, I would expect someone in a harmony class to be able to compose. But it is pretty much like a, a textbook example of good voice leading and um, good choice of chords, good um, harmonic diversity. And um, I think it's a it, it, it's a nice little corral. Um, I hope you enjoyed the uh, the piano arrangement um, at the beginning of the video. And I think we're just going to get started with the analysis. So the first thing that I do when I analyze harmonically, at least uh, when we're talking about music of this time period, is I look for the key. So let's identify the key. We have a sharp in the key signature, which means we're in uh, G major or E minor land. It ultimately depends on what chromatic notes we see. If we were in E minor, we'd be seeing D sharps 100%, but we don't see any D sharps when we're in this piece. Instead, we see F naturals, which means that we're probably gonna modulate to C major at some point or A minor, whatever, whatever ends up working. That being said, um, we're probably in the key of G major because we start and we end on G major. So I'm gonna hedge my bets and say that we're in the key of G major. And I'm going to go ahead and just analyze the first chord. It's a G major triad. And I'm going to mark that with a Roman numeral 1. Uppercase because the quality of the chord is major. And it's a 1 because it's a tonic triad. If we look to the next beat, we have G, B, D, G. And that's another 1 chord. The only thing that changes is that the bass is an octave higher. That's all. Then we have C, or sorry, E, C, E, G. That's a C major triad in first inversion. So four is for C major, because that's the subdominant of the key, and a superscript six, because we're in first inversion. And the outer structure of the chord is no longer a fifth, it's a sixth. Uh, e to C is a, is, is a minor sixth. Then we have a passing tone right here. I'm gonna just mark them. I'm not gonna write passing tone in there or anything. No need, it's just a non-chord tone. And then we have F sharp A, D, D. That's a D major triad in first inversion. So we would use Roman numeral five with a superscript six, five being the dominant and six being the outer, to, to, to notate the fact that it is the outer, the, the outer interval of the first inversion chord is a sixth, F sharp to D, another minor sixth. Okay, so now we have the, uh, we have the second complete measure, that's G, G, D, B, another one chord, no inversions or anything, D, F sharp, D, B, because remember, we have a dotted quarter note over here. That's a three chord. That's our first lowercase Roman numerals, because that's a B minor triad. B, uh, sorry, D, F sharp, D, B. More specifically, it's a three chord in first inversion. And then the A comes in here, and that three chord turns into a five. It's a very weak beat. Um, it's, it's happening on two, and more specifically, it's happening on and of two. So we don't hear it for very long, but there's this six, five suspension going on here. D up to B is a sixth, and then that B turns into an A. So a sixth turns into a fifth, and that turns the three chord into a five chord, which is really cool. E, G, B, G. 
That's an E minor triad, and typically with root position triads, or um, in this case it's a six chord, with root position triads, you usually want to double the root. And that goes for most chords, except for really seven chords, but any non-seven chords, you want to double the root usually. So Bach doubles the, uh, the G here, which is an interesting thing to note. It's totally valid to do, there's nothing wrong with it. But if you're like, you know, doing your harmony homework or something, or if you're trying to solve an exercise and the example doubles the, the G rather than the E, there's probably a reason. And it probably has to do with the fact that singing down to G in the soprano line is more comfortable than just leaping down from A to E. Um, and it might have also led to some, um, some voice leading errors, who knows, but I'm not looking at it too in depth. That being said, C, C, E, G, that's a four chord. Six usually wants to go to two, but two and four are a third apart, and chords that are a third apart will share two notes. So really, chords that are a third apart are pretty much interchangeable for all intents and purposes. And here we have some uh, counterpoint, some rhythmic uh, uh, variation. So the harmonies are harder to pick out. Um, C, B, D, G doesn't spell out any chord, so I think that these are just neighbor tones. And I'm just going to mark them with parentheses. And then we have B, C, E, G. Um, that's also not another chord, so I think that this B right here is like an appoggiatura or something. Maybe it's like an accented passing tone. I don't know. But if we go to A, C, A, or sorry, A, C, E, G, we kind of have like a 2-7 chord going on right here. Um, but it's happening on such a weak beat that I think actually the fact that three of the voices are happening right here, this E might actually be part of like a like a um, upward passing tone figure. Maybe I don't know. I might be overthinking it here. But A C, F sharp C. That's a seven chord, and that's where four actually wants to go. So that's where I think Bach was going with the harmony. These are just some um, interesting suspensions and uh, just. Uh, dissonances and just uh, uh, counterpoint. It's really just counterpoint that's going on here, and I think that the harmony is really happening on two and. Notice how we get two consecutive dominances while happening on two and. That's interesting. And so seven chords usually happen in first inversion because the leading tone and the bass is a really strong sound and it's very cadential. So you uh, you're usually anticipating that in um, coming up to a cadence, which we are. But in this case, we usually see seven chords in first inversion. At least that's that's the way that I learned it. And seven usually goes to one. So G, D, G, B, that's one chord, root position. And instead of cadencing on one, uh, Bach actually cadences on D, D, F sharp, A. That's a five chord. So here we have a half cadence. Half cadence is interesting. It's kind of like a, um, I imagine Bach's doing like grammatical things here. It's like, if you think about a compound sentence, you have your first fragment of the sentence, then a comma, and then you have the second fragment of the sentence. It's like, I went to the store and I bought milk, as opposed to, I went to the store, period, I bought milk. I went to the store would be a uh, an authentic cadence, period, I bought milk. That would be another authentic cadence, as opposed to, I went to the store, comma, it's not a complete thought, and, that would be the half cadence, I bought milk, that would be the, fine, the, the cadence that I would expect to follow it. And we do cadence on G, so I'm going to hedge my bets and say that that is a an authentic cadence. More specifically, it's a perfect authentic cadence because the soprano ends with the tonic in it. Let's take a look at the next beat though. We did a little bit of um, backwards and uh, like jumping around analysis, which can be really helpful in your pieces actually. It's kind of the way that I analyze naturally. So this linear analysis that I'm doing from start to finish is a little, uh, it's not super intuitive to me because I, I, my brain tends to hop around. G, D, G, B. Oh, it's the same chord that we, oh, well, it's not the same chord, but we have this Wait, I saw it. I saw it somewhere. This this exact spelling is going to pop up again somewhere. But this is just another one chord, and that big space between the bass and the tenor. We really have a closed structure here with D, G, and B, where the tenor and the the two upper voices are singing in really close proximity, and the bass just really sticks out with this massive twelfth in between it. I like that sound. And then it looks like we have some parallel. Um, we have some parallel tenths here. Um, going on. So we have F sharp A, D, and D. We've seen that spelling before, but the F sharp is down an octave. That's a 5-6 chord. And here we have G, B, E, D. Ah, oh, we have a 7th chord, and that's interesting because the 7th is created by holding it over a beat, so the soprano is creating kind of like a suspended feel, but the, the, the sound is consonant. That's, that's, that's really beautiful. So we have a 6 chord, 
the it's it's still in first inversion because the third is in the base but because this is a seventh chord we're going to add a five because the structure of the chord now it's a tetrachord so it has four notes in it or four pitches in it and the same way that a seventh uh, a triad that's inverted once has a sixth on the outside when you invert a seventh chord it has a six on the outside and the next interval below that is a fifth because g to e is a major sixth and then g to d is a perfect fifth then we have a c f sharp c good that is a f sharp diminished triad just like how we saw here it's in first inversion you're going to see a lot of first inversion diminished triads because the f sharp and the bass uh, usually means that you're doubling it at least that's the way that i learned so um if you're doubling the leading tone um it, it, it brings a lot of attention to it it's not very the voices aren't as independent there's lots of reasons why uh, composers didn't do that but that, that's the way that i learned about this music then we have b d g b we have a five chord sorry that's a one chord what am i talking about I was thinking ahead to C over here. That's a one chord in first inversion. And it makes sense because we're going five, six, seven, one. We're just ascending the scale. Um, we're, just, we're basically just ascending the scale. C, E, G, A. That's another seven chord. That's a two chord in first inversion. But because it's an A minor seventh as opposed to an A7, we have this sort of suspension going on with the voices having this syncopation here with the two half notes, one half note happening on beat two and one half note happening on beat one, it's a two, six, five, just like how this set six, six, five, sorry if you could hear the busy street that I live on. Um, and then we have D, D, F sharp, A. That's a five chord and we expect two to go to the five. And this right here is a passing tone or we can call it seven. I'm just gonna call it a passing tone but it also happens to be the seventh of the chord because C is a, would, would turn that five chord into a five, seven chord. And then we end on one. Very good. Two five one. Perfect authentic cadence. More specifically, two seven five one. Bach, what are you doing experimenting with, with jazz? See, two five ones have been around a lot longer than a lot longer than jazz. Um, full disclosure, I've been playing uh, jazz since I was itty bitty, so uh, I think I have a little bit of freedom to to joke around with that. That being said, let's move on to the B section because the A section just repeats. So we have a one chord again. I'm not going to bother analyzing it because it's basically just the same same chord, just the voices rotate. Then we have another five chord here. Sorry, I keep on calling it a five chord. Goodness, what's wrong with me? Um, this is a one chord. So one, one, and then we have a passing tone that would turn it into a one seven, but we're just going to call them passing tones instead of reanalyzing the chord. Then we have A, C, E, C. That's a two chord in root position. Then we add the F sharp there. We're just going to call that a passing tone. Actually, you know what? We're going to analyze that right there. And the reason why I'm going to analyze it is because the chord is changing. If the passing tone doesn't change the the, the chord or the tonic of the chord or the way that we hear the chord, um, I'm not going to analyze it. But this right here, there's kind of like a seven going on. F sharp, A, C, C. That's the way that we've been seeing uh, seven chords spelled a lot with an F sharp, two Cs, and an A in the bass. So I think that there's like two and seven. And the thing that ends up happening with chords that are a third apart, like I said, is that they have two notes in common. In this case, they have A and C in common. The only difference is the E and the F sharp. So the fact that there's a kind of like a seven going on here as well is an indication of the fact that Bach is playing with chords that are a third apart which is great. Uh, B, B, G, D, and uh, that's just another one chord. And then we have a passing tone, or sorry, that's not a passing tone, that's a neighbor tone because the A goes back up to a B. And then we have B, we have the same chord again, just that uh, that neighbor tone uh, goes back up here. I'm not gonna reanalyze any chords that appear the same time. And then we have another passing tone here we have a neighbor tone. It doesn't really change the chord because it's just B, C, A, D. That's not a tertian triad because I think I think Bach here is just playing with sounds. It's just it's contrapuntal at this point. There's no emphasized harmony happening. But on beat two we have B, D, G, B. That's just another one chord. What happens here when the bass changes? A, D, F sharp, C. That's a five chord. With it's a 5-7 chord, actually, because there is a C in there somewhere, a C right here. And when you rotate it so that A is in the bass, 
it turns into second inversion. Second inversion triads are used sparingly, but second inversion seventh chords can be used freely because they don't have the same sort of sound. They don't have the same implications in this music. Okay, next we have, we would expect five to go to one, G, D, G, B. That's where that voicing happened right here. I was talking about how something like this would pop up again earlier. Here we are, exact same spelling. Oh, and then look, we have a fermata on the next bar. I don't like the way that that was formatted, actually. You know, if there was a phrase ending, I would not put it on the next line. I would try and find a way to smush this a little bit more and put it here. Because if I was reading ahead, um, I'd have to go to the next line like, oh, we're coming to an end. I feel like if I'm uh, going to the next line, I'm starting something new, not coming to the end of something. But that's just, uh, that's just sort of like my composer brain thinking. And we have another half cadence, which is cool. Uh, notice how the grammatical structure is uh, as similar to the verse part. It's a five chord. Very good. All right, so now we have E, B, E, G. That's an E minor triad. That's a six chord. And here we have E, G, E, B, another version of the six chord. We just have, um, what is it called? And there's like a vocal exchange, like a note exchange. I think there's a particular term for that, but the soprano gets B now, and the tenor gets G. So they just swap voices. D, B, F sharp, B. That is a 3-6 chord. Notice how we have another 3-6 chord again. That's cool. And we have um, a D, B, G, G. That is a 1-6-4 a chord. That's kind of happening in passing. I'm just going to analyze that as a passing tone, though, because it's, such a, it's, it's just a fleeting moment. Um, and it doesn't really justify the chord that's coming after it, which is a C chord, C, E, A, C. Sorry, not a C chord at all. It is an A minor chord in first inversion. So 3, 6, 2, 6. So we have like sort of this descending harmony. And I would expect one to come after this because it's just sort of like a parallel harmony thing going on because we're just descending the scale. The same way that we ascended the scale here, 5, 6, 7, 1, 3, 2, I would expect one to come after it. And probably in first inversion, B, D, A, D. Uh, this A right here is just a suspension. More specifically, it's a 7-6 suspension. Um, a is a 7th above B. G is a 6th above B. And that resolution is really nice. 7-6 suspensions kind of carried, they kind of carried Renaissance counterpoint. So here we have A happening here. So let's see what's happening on beat 2 and. So we have A, D, G, D. I think there's just suspensions going on here. So I'm just going to mark them. I think that's also a neighbor tone. So here we have D, D, G, and A. So this would be a 4-3 suspension because G is a fourth above D, and then it resolves down E. Down by step to a third. So that's another five chord right there if we're thinking about the F sharp, more specifically a 5-7 chord because there's a C in there. And then we get a one chord after a 5-7. That's pretty much a given. We have a passing tone. It's a 1-6 chord now. Um, I'll go ahead and just put 6 there because what's changing is the rotation of the same chord. Oh, and here we go. We have our chromatic note. We have G, D, F, B. That's a G7 chord. Now, when, when we are looking at a G7 chord, um, we're now thinking in terms of C. Now, I'm going to have a hard time fitting all of this in here, but what was once a 5 of 4 because it is the dominant of C, it's now just five. We're going to go from five to one. And this is an, uh, an authentic cadence, but more specifically, it's an imperfect authentic cadence because C being our tonic right here, it does not, uh, actually, you know, have we modulated? I'd say that we have modulated. When you cadence on a key, when you cadence in a new key, that's when I think that you've modulated or you've established the key. I think putting a fermata on a chord is a, it's, it's a very momentary modulation, but it's more than tonicizing the chord. It's more than just this F happening in passing. We uh, hang out on the C for a long enough period of time to call this a modulation. So this chord, which could be interpreted as a secondary dominant because it's a dominant from that we're borrowing from another key, is now being considered the dominant of the primary key because we've modulated to C. And right here, we immediately go back to G, G, D, G, B. Again, that same voicing that we saw earlier. Um, a five chord in the key of C, but I think in the immediate next 
bar, we have F sharp. So we go from F natural back to F sharp, which is diatonic to the key signature. We're going back to G here, and we're going to just call this a one chord. That's where the modulation happens, or at least that's where I think the modulation happens. You could say the modulation happens on the F, like I said earlier here, but that's kind of how I see it. Like I said, without the chorale playing in the background with, uh, with the way that I'm analyzing right now, it's hard to know. But here we have F sharp, D, A, D. That's a five chord in first inversion when we're talking in terms of C. This is a passing tone, but you could also call it a seven because C is the seventh of a D triad or yeah, like a, actually any D triad. Yeah, it's some type of C. C is a seventh above D is what I'm trying to say there. Um, then we have G, B, A, D. We have another uh, G to A. We have a nine eight suspension here because A is a, or a two one nine eight. I, I think I, I I learned them as nine eight suspensions, but I guess two one suspensions would be if this was um it's it's a nine eight suspension. We'll just say that. But this is definitely a one chord when this G gets thrown into the mix. And then we have A C F sharp C. Bach likes that spelling a lot because that's that's another seven six chord. Um, and I think it's the only way the seven six has been spelled actually up until this point, which is fascinating. B D G B. It's a 1-6 chord. Bach really likes that 7-6 to 1-6. We've seen it a couple of different times now. Um, where's the other time we've seen it? Well, we've actually seen a 7-6 in passing here go directly to a 1, but we've seen 7-6 go to 1-6 um, once before. And it happened after the half cadence. So then we go down here. We're going to reanalyze this as 6 to 5-3 because all that's changing is the bass. The, uh, the, uh, the upper notes are just being sustained. Then we have D, D, F sharp, A, that's a five chord. And then this passing tone right here makes it the, makes it, it's, it's the seventh, just like how this passing tone was the seventh of the five. I'm just gonna call it a five though. And here we have E, B, E, G. This F right here is just a suspension over the E. It's another nine, eight suspension, but E, this is a six chord. So we kind of have like a deceptive, it's not really a cadence, but it's like a deceptive progression where we have five going to six as opposed to five going to one. And the reason why five to six deceives you is because six and one are a third apart. So chords that are a third apart, they share two notes in common. In this case, uh, a, three, uh, a six chord in the key of G major is E minor, so E, G, and B. And then a one chord in the key of G, I said G minor, I meant G major. G major, a uh, six chord in the key of G major is E minor, so E, G, and B. And then a one chord is G, B, and D. So they both share G and B. The only difference is the E versus the D. So that's why you feel deceived, because you're expecting the sonority that is a result of G, B, and D, but instead of that D, you hear an E. We have another passing tone, and then we have like an anticipation here. That's like a, it, it's like a very, very quick, Resolution right here. The the suspension's a lot longer than the resolution. Then we have C C E G. That's a a four chord that quickly turns into a uh, well. We have B C uh, F sharp and A. So that's kind of an interesting triad. I think these are all just passing tones. Actually, I don't think this is um, a sonority that's trying to happen because it's almost a three seven chord, but it's not quite. Um, this right here is just being suspended over it. If this was a D, if this D occurred earlier, this would be more of an intentional harmony, but we kind of have like a B7 going on over this uh, tenor that's holding it down here in this measure. And then we have A, D, G, B. We kind of have something similar that happened. Um, where did it happen? It happened here, right here, where the seven really didn't get introduced. Like if this B was an A, we would have had a seven on a prominent beat or at least a numbered B, but no, it gets introduced later, so the harmony happens on the ant, and I think that that's exactly what's happening here. This is a one chord, but the A is like an appoggiatura, so that's like another non-chord tone. All right, so now we're getting into the ca uh, the cadence part of it, so this is a one chord that, oh yeah, well, we would expect one to precede this because we're expecting another half cadence, which is what happens here. This is a five chord, D, D, F sharp, A, and it's the exact same D, D, F sharp, and A that we've had in the three previous half cadences. So Bach is definitely doing this intentionally, that's for sure. And then we have G, D, G, and B. We we're expecting a one after a five for the most part. The G is held over. And then we have G, D, 
A and D. D, A, and D. We kind of have like a suspension going on here because the F sharp, this is really just a 5, 6 chord, but the G is a lower suspension. It's like a G underneath the D. It's like a 5, it's like a 5, 6 suspension. So it's not, uh, the, the, the G is the tonic, so it's kind of like a pedal. It's kind of like, it, it's definitely a suspension, but this F sharp, G going to F sharp. Um, is what this is where the five six happens, but this it's really kind of happening right here. It's happening. Uh, it, it's a mixture of the previous beat and it being over. Like if you've seen this tie here and you've taken counterpoint, you know that you're thinking fourth species right here, and that's definitely what Bach is employing here is like a fourth species figure. Even though I think that method of teaching counterpoint is older, or sorry, more recent than Bach's time, but he's definitely aware of the suspension. And Bach was also a big. A big fan of Palestrina, from my understanding, so he probably knew his counterpoint rules. E, E, G, and C. It's a four chord. And we have a neighbor tone right here. I guess you could kind of call that like a seven going on right here, because four does want to go to seven when you introduce that F sharp right there. So sorry about that, everyone. My camera just gave me an error message when I was trying to uh, record. Hopefully I didn't lose too much, but we were right here just talking about a four chord and this F sharp being introduced to kind of have like a seven six thing going on or more specifically a seven so it would be a seven four two because this would be a seven a seventh chord built on the leading tone uh, so there's kind of like a seven going on right here and when you add that neighbor tone it's like four going to seven and like I said four wants to go to seven but let's check out the next one we have E E, G, and B. That's a six chord in root position. Another passing tone. And then we have C, E, G, and A. That's a two, six, a two, six, five, or a seventh chord, an A minor seven in first inversion. And then we have D, D, F sharp, and A. That's a five chord. And this passing tone could also be considered the seventh of the chord. And we end on one perfect authentic cadence and there you have it oh man my camera died right before the video ended i was so close to finishing without having any breaks in the video but there you have it that is a harmonic or an har a harmonic ana yeah a harmonic analysis of aus minus herzen's Gunde. uh for the sake of our hearts the first bach chorale on the channel if you have any questions about the analysis or if you saw any errors in my analysis or if you might have analyzed something in a different way than I did or if you have recommendations for videos in the future please leave them in the comment section I'm really excited to have some conversations with you all I'm going to be looking at the comment section very attentively and I hope you enjoyed the video even if you're you know new to music and you want to get into analysis and you're just following along for the sake of entertainment or if you're you know working on a corral like this and you're looking for uh, inspiration for your analysis whatever your intention may be you're welcome here at the channel my name is Forrest thanks for checking out the video and I will see you in the next one happy new year